Well, we've been going through a, a fun book of the Bible. It's called 1 Corinthians. And uh, Corinthians is a very interesting book of the Bible. We talked about it last week. But before we get into that, how many of you uh, know someone that's right all the time? And no matter what, they're right all the time. Doesn't make a difference what's going on? Have you ever met someone that has the joy of being right all the time and feels an obligation to set everyone straight at every opportunity? It doesn't make a difference what you're talking about. This person knows exactly how things are supposed to be. And if you say anything wrong, they'll correct you because they'll have Dr. Google with them. <laughs> Everyone's an expert right now. And, and they are the fact checker, right? What they're saying is correct. They know what's going on in our country. They know the proper church. They know what political party is doing. They're, and the folks know that there's no division right now in the body of Christ. Correct, everybody? No, 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 no. And, and there, there are those people in this world that sincerely believe that God has gifted them with a discernment that they know. They sense stuff. They know that there's disturbance in the force. They're Jedi Christians, right? They know what's going on in your life. They have it all figured out. They have the answer to everything. How many people know people like that? You guys are really blessed. I know a lot of people like that. Come on, see a show of hands. How many new people like that and know everything? Okay. If you don't know anyone that's that way, you're that person. <laughs> Just saying. There's a lot of opinions today. What does the Bible say about it? What is going on? They want to set everyone straight. You know, I, also, it's something that we have innate in our human, human capacity. Psychology today calls it the guru syndrome, that you and I want a guru. We want someone we can look up to. We want a model of someone that we like. We like models. We like idols. Why? Because if we can see it, visualize it, perhaps even touch it, we like it. Because God is too immaterial, let me go ahead and go after somebody. So we have this guru people, and we want a guru. We want someone that we will follow. And, and, and often there are these people that disseminate propaganda, if you disagree with them, you're an evil person. Have you noticed that? There's no room for debate. It's my way or the highway. The highway. Absolutely. And we're often, what often happens is they misrepresent people. They often take a, a position and they make a caricature of it. You know what a caricature is? If you saw a picture of me, they would draw a picture of me in a cartoon way. It's a caricature. You would exaggerate all my amazing features. <laughs> right? So this is what begins to happen. We, we begin to demonize people, and we see that happening right now. And we're often tempted to do that. Have you noticed that, everybody? we got about two weeks until the elections come, and I want to encourage you, everybody, that we got to be biblical, not political. we got to be biblical, not political. I just want to encourage everybody, look at what the Word of God says, look at the policies say, try not to get distracted with the people, and look at the policies and see what God says in his word about these things. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a disgrace to all people. You see, when political gets into theology, that's not a good thing. So we're not, we're not, we're not political, we're biblical. And I want to encourage you with that, especially in these days where people have different views. And if you don't agree with them, look out. Right? So... We'll get into that in a few moments, how we handle that. Now, how do we get away from us? How do we get along? Let's make a move to change. How would you guys like to get along with different people? Wouldn't that be nice? Right. Absolutely. Let's look at what the Word of God says about it. The Apostle Paul is talking to a church in Corinth. Corinth is a, a very popular city. It's a seaport area where people take... It's a long story. I'll tell you more about it in the future. But they have different temples that are there. They have, they have legalized prostitution. In fact, if you're a good church person, you'll go to the prostitute. In fact, there are people that would go to the church on Sunday and visit the prostitute during the week and go back to church and say, hey, it's okay. It's just God's grace. God forgives me. God understands. There are people that were dividing over all sorts of things. It was, you think our society today is bad? We got nothing compared to this Corinthians. Remember, if you don't like somebody and they're kind of crazy, just call them a Corinthian. You're just a Corinthian. A person who's wild. Okay? What happens in Corinth? 
God knows about, okay? So this is the kind of deal. We're, they're dealing with this really, really bad church, and this church is so much division. But they're not void of the power of God. There's miracles taking place. People are speaking in spiritual languages. People are prophesying. I mean, the dead, I mean, people are being healed. Amazing things are happening. And despite all that fact, there's great division. And sometimes the enemy, his best and his most prolific tactic against the church is to create disunity with God and disunity with each other. Because Jesus said, Lord, let them be one as we are one that the world would know that I was sent. So why are there 45,000 different denominations? We're not going to get into that. We did last week, but let's get back to what we're talking about. Here's the Apostle Paul. We're going we're to start at chapter 3, go back to chapter 1 and chapter 2, and we're going to look at it. I encourage you to read 1 Corinthians for yourself. It's a whole, he's dealing with the situation, and it will help you to track where we're going, okay? Here we go. But brothers, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the what? Flesh. As infants in Christ. In other words, they were babies. They were babies. Now, what are babies like? Babies are cute, right? They're beautiful. I love babies. They're good when they're babies, right? What does he say? But as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. So these are believers, but they're infants. He says, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Hey, guys, ever try to feed a baby something else? What does it do? It spits it up. If you have people in your life that keep spitting up at you when you bring them a different, perp, a different viewpoint, could be that they're babies. Or if you keep spitting up, maybe you're a baby. You can't deal with conflict. You can't deal with someone that thinks differently than you. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Even now, you're not ready. Now, you're still not ready. There are people out there that I know. I know some people that have kids. And, you know, once we get out of the baby food, we get into what? Chicken nuggets and mac and cheese, right? <laughs> there are a lot of Christians out there that live on chicken nuggets and mac and cheese Christians. They don't like any other food but chicken nuggets and mac and cheese. They'll have no Thai food, no Indian food, right? It, no Italian food. Well, mac and cheese is sort of Italian. It's chicken nuggets and macaroni. I remember growing up and my parents would take us to a very expensive restaurant and my brothers and I were frustrated because we wanted to go to McDonald's. <laughs> They're spending like a lot of money. Back in those days, they spent like $20 on a meal. Can you imagine that? Today, let's not talk about it. So we want to, you know, today I can't eat at McDonald's. God bless McDonald's. I love a Big Mac. It goes down great, but I'm paying the price for the rest of the week. So you have this, he says, I fed you with milk, not solid food for you. You were not ready for it. And so people are like, I want more deep teaching. I, I want more, I like these pastors, they're so deep. I, I walk and I scratch my head. Wow, so deep. That's such a deep sermon. Oh, I want to hear more. I'm not getting fed where I'm going. I want more deep theology. People talk about this all the time. I want more deep teaching. You know what's deep? And even now, you're not ready, he says. Why? For you're still of the flesh. How do you know if you're of the flesh? How do you know if you're a toddler in the faith? Here's a good test. For while there is what? Jealousy and strife among you. Are you not of the flesh behaving only in a what? human way. Right now, if we could take a, uh, take a camera and look into the nursery right now. Right now, we have an opportunity. We could probably do it, but we're not going to do it. We look into the nursery, and there's this Thomas the Train. Okay? He sure top and hat is not there. I, I still like Thomas the Train, by the way. It's one of the most relaxing things to watch. There could be a nuclear war, but if you're watching Thomas the Train, it's like, ah, all is well. <laughs> so when I'm stressed out of a long day... I put Thomas the train on. So there's Thomas the train all by himself, and some child, some toddler decides to grab that Thomas the train. All of a sudden, all 20 children who don't care about Thomas the train all want to have the toy. Why? Because that little boy or little girl has Thomas the train. And now, mine, right? The first thing a child says is not mommy, it's 
mine. Right? It's mine. And then they start, they turn red in the face, and they cry, and what do we got? We have to pick them up. Oh, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And I, I, I've done that for a while. I'm tired of doing that, by the way. Oh, it's going to be okay. Cornerstone loves you. Okay. Listen, it's cute when they're babies. But if you're 45 years old, eating mac and cheese and chicken nuggets and living in your parents' basement, maybe there's a problem here. And you have an opinion about everything. You're posting about everything. You're getting in fights about everything. For one says, what does he say? For all you still not in the flesh. So how do you know you're grown up? You want to be spiritual mature? Are you offendable? Let me just say something really important. The level of your spiritual maturity is very much seen by how offended you get. If everything offends you, you're immature, and so am I. I can't believe they said that. <laughs> okay. The cats worry me. The dogs just bark. The cats do something they shouldn't be doing. Can I tell you a little story? We had, okay, when I got married, you're going to be surprised about this. We had a cat. There's a reason I don't like cats. And this cat was jealous when I got married to Sandra. So we'd be in the bedroom at night, and this cat would be going like this on the door, trying to get into the bedroom, trying to get into the bed. And guess what the cat did? It defecated on Sandra's pillow. That's what you call a baby Christian. <laughs> Sadistic, sn- a dog would just bite you and it's over with. Another cat, you know, it would purr, you know, all that. And then when you're not looking... That's why we got rid of it. We cast out that cat. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> but some of you are like that. Some of you are dog Christians and some of you are cat Christians. The cat Christians I worry about because you're sneaky. So if you're getting offended, listen, everybody, you've got to get to the point where I'm not offended anymore. Jesus said it's impossible that an offense will not come. People will offend you. But you need to know how to get over it. If you're offended, they make me sick. No one makes you sick. You make yourself sick by taking the stimuli the person is giving you and swallowing it and getting agitated. The sign of spiritual maturity is a person who refuses to be offended. If you vote differently, oh, well, I'm not going to worry about it because I know the truth. And I'm always right. (laughs) Seriously, stop getting offended. You want to know your maturity. Anytime you get offended, ask the Lord Jesus, am I offended because the gospel of Jesus Christ is compromised or my view of what I think is important is? The sign of maturity is a person who lives dead. We should be, listen, I've done it before. I've gone to the graveyards. If you go to the graveyard and you talk to a tombstone, you jerk, and you go ahead. Go ahead and tell the person in the grave, you're a jerk, I can't stand you. What happens? Nothing, Nothing, right? You can't offend a dead person. I am dead, and I'm alive in Jesus Christ. That's the kind of people we should become. So when you're offended, I'm not saying we walk around, okay, it's okay, hit me again. Boop. I'm going to walk around like a wimp. No, we're not saying you walk around a wimp, have no backbone, make no impact on the society. No, but you're not reacting. You're not a reactor. You're a responder. A reactor has nuclear waste coming out of it. You want to respond while you're thinking and you're controlled by the Spirit of God, not your flesh. And listen, I'm Italian. Hello. We have a lot of passion, Italians. And Germans know how to make it hurt. So I'm both. It's kind of scary. That's why I need Jesus. <laughs> For you're still the flesh. Verse 6, verse 3. You're still the flesh. For while there is what? Jealousy. It's not fair. How come they're on the teaching team? Why are they singing the, the thing? Why are they doing this? Where well, there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh behaving only a human way? We're not called to be human. We are called to die to ourselves. We're called to be born again. 
I need to rise up. The old man has to die every day. The old woman has to die every day. Every day, I have to count myself dead and alive to Christ. For one says, how do you know? For when one says, I follow Paul, the apostle Paul is, is, is repeating himself like a good pastor. We talked about this in chapter one. For one will say, oh, I follow Paul. And Paul is an apostle to the non-Jewish people primarily. I follow Apollos. Apollos is the Greek. He's the Presbyterian of the group. I grew up Presbyterian. What we would do, we would be in these, these, these pews, and I never understood why they called them pews. I thought because people stank, and, I, and then they drank. But anyhow, but that's a final point. So it, we were in these pews. They're hard. They're hard. And, and, and I don't know how it was in those churches, but you were not allowed to make much noise. But my grandmother would always have a piece of caramel, and she would open the thing, and everyone in the church could hear her open it up. And then we'd be sitting there, all rise. We'd all stand up. We'd have responsive reading. The guy, the, the guy would read something. We'd read it back. We'd sit down, stand up, sit down. I mean, I had good quads. It was fantastic. It was great. It was great. And I'm not, we'd say the Apostles' Creed every week. It was fantastic. We did the Lord's Prayer. We'd have the Eucharist. It was great. There's nothing wrong with it. But that's the way we did church. And, and, and that was the Presbyterian way. And it was really intellectual. You know, you quote a lot of people that you can't pronounce their names. It's fantastic. And you walk out saying, it was deep. What does it mean? I don't know, but it was deep. <laughs> so, you know, the people like that, I, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. And, and, they say, and, and they said about the apostle, what's guy, apostle Paul? This is what they say about him in other letters. His, his letters are pretty heavy hitting. But his speech is contemptible. He's kind, of a, he's kind of a short guy with a big hooked nose and bulging eyes. That's what church tradition tells us about the apostle. Well, it was not really impressive. He didn't come, back with a, he didn't come up with a six-pack abs and wasn't all like oiled up before he got on the stage, right? He didn't have, all, didn't have the great hair. Can I hear an amen? The Bible says the less hair you have, the more godly you are. So, you know, he was not that impressive, but he had the power of God in him. And see, what happened is people, we like to pick our favorites. We like to pick certain pastors or certain movements. This is the best way. For one says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? For what is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as a Lord assigned to each. And so it really is not about that. It's not about if you like, listen, there's nothing wrong with liking a certain type of pastor or preacher. Some people are more intellectually based. And that's fine. The Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, which means your emotions, and your strength. And so that's okay if someone is more that way. Some people like a church that's really exuberant and the pastor is yelling at you the whole time. I like it too. I like that. I like the quiet. You know, I like the quiet. It doesn't really make a difference. We make preferences the most important thing. So what he says, I planted a palace water, but God, who gave the growth? God did so neither who plants nor who waters is anything, but only God who gives growth. He who plants and the one waters are one. Each will receive a wage according to his labor. So stop looking to human institutions. Listen, we thank God for the church. We thank God for great teachers and good pastors. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I remember going to a, on vacation someplace. I was at, at, a, at a mega church and a big church, and it was a pastor I wanted to hear, and I was all excited to go, and they had a guest speaker. And the guest speaker was boring. I'm like, they put this guy up here? This guy should be in the minor leagues. I was like, I was judging the guy, how he dressed, how he talked, and all that. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's like, <coughs> excuse me. What do you think you're doing? You're judging the package. Why don't you listen to the word he's preaching? And so I asked God to forgive me, and I listened, and I got something out of the message because it's from the Bible. I mean, we go to church, entertain me, I'm an American. Entertain me, I'm an American. That's entertainment, right? I want to be entertained. I want to be enlightened. And so he says, it's not that. He who plants, he who waters, each one will receive the wages, 
for his labor. So what, what do we do? How do we find unity? Listen, everybody, this is not like a super deep message, but as we already have pointed out, what's deep is when you're not offended. What's deep is when you're not a, not a oh, that's okay, no problem. No, I'm not talking to me walk around, don't care about anything. I'm saying you got to the point where you're not offended anymore. You're going to trust God in what you're doing. And you know what happens when you're not offended? You're a lot more happy. And you're a lot easier to live with. Some of you are going, stop ribbing your spouse, okay, or your kids. And this is what the Apostle Paul said, and we're going back to chapter 1 again. Because this is the centrality of what makes it all work. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are what? What do you mean being saved? If you're saved and that's the end of it. What's this being is actually meaning that you're constantly becoming more saved. I thought that's workspace. No, you're saved. The Bible says, he who began a good work in you in Philippians will be faithful to complete it in Christ Jesus. So God works in you, Right? He who began a good work in you. And then the Bible says, another chapter later, Philippians, says, therefore, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why do I have to have fear and trembling? For it is God who is at work with you, both to will and to do what he's called you to do. So when you have a godly idea, it's God speaking. Listen to the Holy Spirit inside of you. And work out the salvation with fear and trembling. You see, people, they rather have a pastor to look at, listen to a podcast, read a book, go to a certain movement. But do you realize this desire to make an idol has always been with mankind? That's why it says in the Bible, you shall have no idols before me. Do you realize the Israelites wanted an idol as well? You know what happened when Moses disappeared? Where's this guy Moses? Give us an idol. It wasn't an American idol. It was Moses was my idol. And... God brought them to the base of the mountain where Mount Sinai is. This is a very key point in the Bible because God told Moses uh, where I, when he met with Moses on a mountain, he says, what I had with you, this interaction, I want you to bring the people to the same mountain so they can have the same experience. So what did he do? Through the Spirit of God, they got out after the nine plagues. They came to the Mount Sinai before that. He said, get yourself ready in three days. God is going to speak to you. And then God speaks to the people with fire. And it's amazing what's happening is the Spirit of God is so bright that every room of their life is laid bare open. In other words, they see all their sin. They can't hide their sin because the light is so bright. Everything is being seen. All the mice are trying to run out into the walls and they can't because the light is shining. Listen, everybody, if I had the opportunity right now to show what's in your heart on this screen, who would stay in this room? Nobody. Right? And so the light came on. They're like, no, 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 no. Moses, 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 Moses. No, 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 no. You, you go to God for us. No, we don't want to deal with this, Moses. You go to God and we'll listen to you. Why do they say that for? Well, you can see what Moses says. He says the following. He says, don't be afraid of God, but fear God. What does that mean? Don't be afraid of God, but know that he's a consuming fire. Fear him, respect him. No, Moses, you do it. And so we wanted somebody else to stand in between us and God. And today we do the same thing. If I can put everything on my pastor, everything on a movement, anything on what I like to do, then I don't have to take personal responsibility as much. And I can criticize it then. I'm just saying. So it's the word of God it's folly to those who don't understand. Why? Because the cross makes no sense. But to us who, who are being saved, there's a process of it's called so-so, becoming more free. We want to work out God's freedom in our lives. And our job at the church really is to help you and encourage you, myself included, to grow strong in the Lord and our, ourselves that we could affect the world. But to those that are being saved, it is what? The power of God. It's not just good theology. It's not just good. We need the power of God through the Holy Spirit to change. If you think you can do it just by having a good church, well, I need the Spirit of God right now to speak to you, to work in you, to bring healing upon your life, and I need it myself. You see, look what he says. Where, where's the one who is wise? 
Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? Absolutely. You know what changes everything, everybody? There's only one way. I think you know it. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The key that gave Jesus the power in his life is the same keys for the power of God in your life. You know what it is? It's called surrender. We talked about this. The tender of surrender. Tender is the buying power of heaven. It is your and my surrender to God. Complete surrender is the tender. And you need to keep your heart tender to the Lord. The problem with us, myself included, is my heart gets hard and my feet become tender. Ow! I keep getting offended by everybody. But what we want to do is have hard feet and a tender heart. Most of us have tender feet and a hard heart. When you get offended by everything, you have tender feet. You want to have a tender heart. Listen, when I don't care about people, when I drive through a city and see the homeless and don't care, when I see people who vote differently than I do or live differently than I do and don't care and wish them harm, I got a, hard prob- I got a heart problem going on. For God, so what? Yeah, I need to change. How do we do that? Well, what makes it so important is the cross of Christ. Now, how many of you would like to get this if your spouse gave you that for Valentine's Day or Christmas? Would you like that? It's not a commode. It's a guillotine. I thought it was a commode, and this is the door. No, 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 no. No, it's a guillotine. Imagine giving your spouse or girlfriend that. That's ridiculous, right? You have to understand that the cross was extremely offensive in the time of Jesus and the apostles. It was the most heinous. It was one of the most sadistic forms of torture ever devised by mankind. I could go on about it. They go through your, your, your sciatic nerves and different things like that. Animals would peck at you. You'd be there for days at times. It is horrible, horrible, horrible. And no one would want to do that. But it became a symbol of the church. Can you imagine having this? An electric chair? That's appropriate for this month, I suppose, but I disagree. I disagree. But there, you know, you wouldn't do that. Why? It was offensive. The cross is offensive. You mean my Messiah? Jesus, the great Messiah, is going to be a suffering servant and die on a cross of a criminal? That, I want nothing to do with that. We're supposed to be bold and take over. God has made me the head and not the tail. We're going to kick everyone's tail. We got Jesus on our side. We're going to overcome. And here is Jesus dying on the cross, which basically blew away their theology because they didn't understand it happens in stages. So what makes it different is the cross of Christ. What are you and I supposed to do? Sorry. He says this. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you what? You agree that there be no divisions among you, but you be united in the same mind, the same judgment. He goes this. But we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews because the Jews want a powerful uh, religion of their day to overcome their adversaries and to be the head and not the tail. They wanted signs. They wanted power. There are people that run. I want power. I want the power of God. I want anointing. I want. Listen, we want that too. But Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew who you were. That doesn't save you, power, signs, and wonders. We thank God for those. We want to see more of that. Or great intellect. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and folly to the Gentiles. They're like, what is this ridiculous thing of a cross? So you get ahead by suffering and dying? For the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Look what the Apostle Paul says. He says the following. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom? For I decided to know what? Nothing. I decided to know nothing among you except what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, everything that matters to me is about Jesus. You see, the common 
We have to find freedom and unity by the highest common denominator. The highest common denominator is Jesus crucified on the cross. You see, Jesus had to die to himself to do what God said exclusively, not my will, your will be done. That's the key, is complete surrender. And then as a result of that, God raised him to the name above all names. Because why? Because he was in complete surrender. You see, you and I have to go to the cross daily. Jesus says, unless you pick up your cross and follow me daily, you cannot be my disciple. See, so every time I'm offended, I'm going to put myself back on the cross. i got to die to this. He says, for I decided to know nothing among you except Christ crucified. He goes on to say, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but a demonstration of the Spirit and power. We need the Spirit and power today. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to flow in the Holy Spirit, but we don't need to be arrogant about the Holy Spirit either. We should be thinking, if not by grace. And listen, the older I get, the more amazing I become. Now, the older I get, the more I realize I need God. I'm a lot more gracious than I used to be. I used to judge different churches and think that, listen, I have my preferences. I told you last week, I'm not a big fan of a big poster with the pastor like this. I'm not a big fan of people oiling up and bench pressing before they get on the stage because I'm jealous I don't look that way. (laughs) I'm not about that, right? I don't like all that. But guess what? God's still working through those people. I don't like it. It's not my place. As for me and my house, we'll be a little bit different. You follow me, everybody? I'm not sitting here to do everything like that. You see, in my speech and my message, we're not plausible words, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. We need more in this age. In the age of all, we have so much information coming these days. There's plenty of information, but what's needed more than ever is the power of the spirit of Jesus Christ. We need the power of the spirit. We need the power of love. We need signs and wonders to bring people to the amazing love of Jesus Christ, not to a flamboyant pastor. So your faith may not rest in Cornerstone and any particular pastor or leader, but in the power of God. If I am bringing attention to myself only, it's a problem. You see, we have to focus on the highest common denominator, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the cross that adds to us and subtracts the flesh. You see, right every day, it's about an ad sign. You want to add to your life? You can, it's like a plus sign. You need a plus sign of your life? Keep adding the cross. How is the cross in my relationship with the boss I don't like? Is my cross if my spouse or my parents? I have to add by subtracting myself and by adding the cross. It's the great common denominator. You see... We talked about this last week. It begs to bring us again. We need to focus on the absolutes. This is the absolute. Without the cross, it all falls apart. Essentials, the infallibility of the Bible. We have to believe the Bible is our final authority. And if you disagree with it, oh well. God will deal with you. I am not your God. I don't judge who goes to heaven and hell. I will speak the truth. I will tell you that Jesus is the only way, truth, and the life. But I do not determine where people go. I don't walk around, neither do you. And so we want to bring people to the absolute truth of God. We need to be unified. We have these other issues of baptism of the Holy Spirit, methods, that's fine. We have theology. We have pre-trib, post-trib, no-trib. Don't divide over that. That's silly. It's okay to believe a certain thing. Or this is happens the most in most churches. It's called preferences. If you're really spiritual, you should speak very softly. Welcome to Cornerstone Church. We're so glad that you're here today. The Bible says, be still and know that thou art God. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. There are times to be quiet. But if I'm, yeah, yeah praise God, that's not godly, and this is better like this. The Bible says when you pray, go into a secret place and shut the door that God will hear you. And so these prayer meetings, they're, they're too loud and boisterous. The Bible says they lifted their voices and, and in the book of Acts, and they spoke powerfully together in prayer. There's different preferences. So it's time for you to get off your chicken nuggets and mac and cheese 
and let's get some Thai food. Can I hear an amen? amen. Yeah. Let's, get, let's go to the sushi, baby. I like sushi. Right? Let's get that, that amazing green stuff. I forgot the name of it, but it's fantastic, and it clears your sinuses. Can I hear an amen? Fantastic. <laughs> Let's try different foods. Let's not be stuck in our mac and cheese world thinking that's all we're going to have. You know, we have people preferences. Well, I think the church should be this way. The church, and the people criticize it like, I found the better way. No, you did not find the better way. There's only one way. Jesus is the only way. Stop the preferences. Well, the worship is so anointing. As I mentioned last week, the pastor's hot. I know, I know, I am hot, I'm sweating. Who cares if the pastor's cool and is wearing $600 tennis shoes? It's not about that. we got to stop all that. And, you know, God's shaking the church right now, and he's even shaking me because I think I'm better. I'm not better. So we need to have the essentials. So what does this all mean? I'm so glad you asked. What do we do as we conclude? The Bible says this, For we are both God's workers, and you are his field. Let's talk about the church. You are God's building. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid a foundation, an expert builder. Now others are building upon it. See, the apostle Paul says, I'm just doing my job. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a construction worker. God's the architect. I'm just doing my job. I'm laying the cement, put up the steel beams, and then the electricians will come in, right? The Canadian drywallers will come in. The French Canadians will come in. They do an amazing job. Oh, what does it say? But whoever is building on this foundation must be careful, for no one can lay a foundation other than what has been already laid by Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus. It's about the cross of Christ. Anyone who builds on the foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, and straw. But on Judgment Day, fire will reveal what each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. If it's all about my ego and being right and winning an argument, and I love Jesus, I get into heaven one day, and I have nothing to show for it. You got in. You smell like you've been in the smoking section. Because everything's been about you. About you winning the argument. About you being right. About people liking you as a pastor. Hello. When I get offended by you, I got a problem. And God, I don't want to be offended by anyone but the enemy of my life. The builder will be saved like someone barely escaping. So, see, God judges our hearts. Man looks at the outside. I don't have the capacity to look into your heart. Well, the Lord has given me discernment. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, all right. Maybe the Lord gives you insights. That's fine. But do you think you really have the capacity to look on someone's heart? You can't even judge your own heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitful. Who can know it? Right? So listen, everybody. God looks at our hearts. And so maybe someone is not living a life that you deem to be spiritual, but their heart is right and they don't know any better. Aren't you glad God didn't give you what you deserve? I had a pastor say this to me a number of years ago. I haven't used it in a while. I'll say it again. He said, if you and I got what we deserved, we should all be taken outside, blindfolded, and shot. Now, pastor, that's a bit crazy. Well, we're all worthy of death. There's wickedness lurking in every of us. Who knows the wickedness in your heart and my heart, if not for God? And if you don't think you got wickedness in you, you're deceived. We have a toxic disease called sin. And every day, we have to take a treatment of the cross we got to hook up and hook up to the cross and flush our system with the antibodies of the cross to get rid of the diseased blood of the flesh, which will kill you or make you immovable. Make you movable and make you weak. We need to focus on the highest common denominator of the cross of Christ, and we need to count ourselves dead to self and alive to Jesus. See, the Bible says... So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. Lord, I don't want sin ruling on my body anymore. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, 
In Jesus' name, I'm challenged by this. Lord, I wish it could be something that's philosophically challenging, Lord. I wish this message could be something that is more entertaining. But Lord, it's, it's a little bit draining because it's dealing with the very core of our being. Father, you're calling us to complete surrender. Father, we've been offended by things that frankly don't matter. Lord, all we should really care about is you and you crucified on the cross and that we're dying daily. Father, forgiving us, forgive us for being the judge of all people, forgiving us for letting our preferences and our own theological swayings that are not essential to divide us and to put us in a place of separation when you're calling us to come together. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray you bring healing. I, Lord, I pray to some people in here today that you are offended with your spouse. You've had so many arguments. You've never settled any of them. You have a bunch of open windows in your life. What I mean by that is you have a bunch of, of open conflicts that have never been solved in your marriage, and you don't know if you can hang on another day. God said you need to forgive each other like I forgave you. Who do you think you are? Not to forgive when I've forgiven you. Father, help us to get a vision of what we are without you. Lord, it's scary to think what we are without you. We're wicked and sinful and have a toxic disease. But Father, we thank you that in you, Jesus, when we let your blood flow through us, we become whole, healed, conformed to your image, and become freer. So Father, I pray that we become a church that's unoffendable, that we would follow you above our thoughts and feelings and likes and dislikes, that you would be the get-all of all things. In Jesus' name.